I would like to now call on Barry, Barry Gills. I think this is going to really also complement because none of this is going to be so possible without the killing of truth or change in our mentalities. So, Barry, I leave it to you. Can you hear me? Is it, do I have to turn this on? Yeah. This one? You can hear me. Hello. All right, thanks, everyone. I, I just wanted to say thank you at first by, for the fact of inviting me to be here and be here with you uh, at this conference discussing this topic at this time. Uh, it's a privilege and a joy, actually, which I'm going to carry with me. And I hope we all will and be empowered by this. And Nazan just mentioned deep historical process. So my first part of my reflections are going to be about some of that and, and uh, reflections from world system theory. So first, is I think this is a, a, an insight, like a prediction, that came from Emmanuel Wallerstein uh, some decades ago. And he was talking about the, the secular trends, the cycles, the rhythms of the capitalist world economy in a research working group he was with at SUNY New York. And so it's, it's looking at commodification as a, a world historical process. Um, and as commodification is like it's a, a, a process that, as in mathematics, it, re, it, it approaches an asymptote. It's constantly moving and increasing and increasing, going into new frontiers, new spheres, colonizing new spheres of life endlessly. But it, but it, 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 it goes always toward the asymptote, but does, does not reach it. But what he said was that as it, it, as it goes perilously close to the asymptote, the capitalist world system will implode. It will fail. It will, it will, it will exhaust itself, reach the ultimate historical limits of capital accumulation, the social limits, the ecological limits. And I would make the proposition that we, we are seeing the signs that we are approaching that moment that he predicted, um, and that you know, the relentless expansionist uh, uh, logic of capital is to do that, is to colonize, commodify, decommonize, alienate all spheres of life to subordinate to itself for the purposes of the accumulation of capital. And that, what, the first proposition that we made in world system theory that myself and, and Gunder Frank was that you have to, you have, you should examine, why, I mean, why history? You know, um, it, it had to do with origins and what you could learn from origins. Um, as Wallerstein had said, world historical systems have an origin, they have an apogee, and they have a demise. And we should remember that about the capitalist world system. It has an origin 5,000 plus years ago. It has an apogee, which was in the past, and then it has a demise phase, which is now. Um, so those forms, you want to examine what they are. Where, how did they come into being will tell you a great deal about their essence and then the, what their trajectories would be, what their, what their logic is, their, 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 their character historically. See, So that's capital, the state, class-based hierarchical society, and perhaps certain kinds of ecologically parasitic urbanism, and how they combine as forces in global history in deep historical process that help us to understand how we moved across these millennia to the, to the present acute situation of a kind of the most crisis-ridden period in, in human history, it might be said. Uh, and then, and then, you know, that you, when you see this, I sometimes talk about capital versus oikos, rather like, in a way, resonant with Rosa Luxemburg, that, that capital encounters the non-capitalist, the beyond capital, where most of humanity has lived for most of our species' existence, uh, we know from various people, including Wingro and Graeber, who did a monumental work on this not so long ago. Um, but that it, in, it encounters these and it is an antagonistic relationship. Capital is not only parasitic, but it's so antagonistic that you might say that the tendency is that capital annihilates oikos. 
Yeah, it, it, and that is how capital reproduces itself until it reaches almost to the asymptote, you see. But right now, capital's new frontiers are what? The ocean seabeds for minerals, outer space and asteroids and the moon for minerals, and you, us, our, our private life datafied for data extractivism, for capital accumulation. So it, it is still trying to push now the ultimate limits and into the hinterlands, you know, into the Amazon, into the, into the deserts, into the ice world. It, you know, this is all happening right now, which tells you that you're, you know, in this particular uh, demise phase. So just some, some, uh, some reflections on what some things that we said that are not, in a sense that we, we were parallel to and converged with the thinking of Abdullah Ajalan, which we only came to know after the fact, uh, because we never were able to meet and have a dialogue. Um, but some, some of those things that we, I like say that now kind of Ajalan agrees, or it's become common, uh, a way of looking at it, is that this world system driven by capital as a central driving force, that was our central hypothesis, for five millennia. The capital is not marginal, but is actually central governing and driving the expansion of the system. So of the whole system, the world system. So that it creates a hierarchical structure always, in those perpetually for five millennia, of center periphery hierarchies, even in a multi-centric structure, of hegemony rivalry cycles, some, some periods of general hegemony and some periods of intense rivalry between the contending centers for the next hegemony. Repeated cycle over the millennia. And long cycles of systemic expansion and the contradictions of that expansion phase creating the next systemic crisis and repeated on and on and again. And you would argue, I would argue, that we're in that structure now where the norm for millennia was a multi-centric world system which united all, the whole, you know, much of the world in one in one system, uh, but the Europeans, Eurocentrism, the past, the past few centuries, was an incredibly brutal, violent, conquest-oriented way of making the system unicentric for the only time in its history. And in that way, it's, it's like an aberration. And it, in all its monstrosity, it is an aberration. And we see ourselves now going beyond the Eurocentric structure that was created, slowly and painfully, but back, in a sense, to the norm, which is a multi-centric system, to the post-Eurocentric system. So we we have we have agreed that the world system is millennia old, that it has these continuities to continuities of structure. Which think about overthrowing any of those structures right now. What will that entail? Overthrowing any of those is is really a huge a huge challenge, to put it mildly. Um, but that also, you know, we, we, we agreed that in, in the general critique of Eurocentrism, the origins of the world system need to be seen outside Europe. It's very necessary to do that, to, to rectify the grotesque and epistemicide distortions that Eurocentric historiography created, you know, rewriting and fundamentally lying <laughs> about the history of the world and erasing histories of multiple peoples and civilizations. You know, multiple histories were, were not just, uh, uh, you know, they were, they were erased, you know, and put into this new mass narrative, uh, Eurocentric narrative, which now absolutely we're in the phase of overthrowing to a new kind of understanding of humanity's global history. And beyond what Algerland has agreed very much about going beyond the limitations of the state and the nation and methodological nationalism in the way that we understand all these processes. We understand them as world historical processes of deep history that involve all humanity and are now planetary physical scale. Okay, so there's a kind of, well the one thing I also very much accept and agree and, and humbly ex uh, I'm grateful for is the critique that Ogilvy made of the work that we did, Frank and I did, saying that well, that, or that, you know, I, I think you did a good job <laughs> with with what you did, uh, but you, you, the, the deepest flaw was that you didn't offer any way out of the system, you, see, you know. And I've been studying Ogilvy, I have become a student of Ogilvy, you know, and more so, and I will be, and more, I, I can, will, in, you know, continue <laughs> on that path, you know, to, that, because you're absolutely right. You know, that was a, f a terrible flaw and omission. 
and that this is why this is so important. You know, then the, the real focus, you know, you don't, you don't study history just for history's sake. This is not so fruitful, right? It's trying to understand, put, put everything that's happening into a framework of understanding that helps you see the, the things that must be overthrown, the things that must be undone, the, the knowledge that must be unlearned, and re, what should be relearned, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So, you know, okay, we all know that one of the aspects of this moment I'm talking about is that we're in this uh, really acute combined climate change, ecological, social, and capitalist crisis all in one. You know, some people call pluri crisis and so on. Um, and we, we know, I'm sure you know, that, that capital and, and global capital accumulation are actually the real causes of all of the rest of the crisis all combined. The real driver, the real root, you know. This has been said here already, this conference, rightly. Uh, and that when you, when you look at this climate and ecological crisis together with the capitalist crisis, uh, one, they're, they're, they're twinned in a way that one crisis cannot be solved without fundamentally solving the other, you see. And they are causal drivers of each other. Uh, so we've seen that just lately you know, how serious the situation is with the synthesis report from the, the AR6 of the IPCC. You know, we are, we, are, we are getting perilously close to certain kinds of tipping points and cascading tipping point risks, you know, which would then lead to really dramatic ecological and social failures, which of course is also historically, if you look at it dialectically, a moment of opportunity for transformative praxis, but you have to know which transformative praxis that you, you are trying to achieve. And this is another huge lesson in everything that Ogilvy writes. You know, if you look at the lessons of the past and the failures of past rebellions and revolutions, which are perennial, <laughs> uh, uh, that, but you, you, must, you must have very, very clear and firm ideas about what it is that is necessary to do to have a plan, yeah, a vision, and more than a vision. So this, this is the situation we're in. And we, we, and we know that right now the historical imperative for the whole planet is that we must have a deep ecological and social restoration. But on what basis would that be? I mean, in the last panel we started to be honest about our spiritual reflections on what we do, you know. And I welcome that very much. And I've got some notes here about that. Because we, we must have this moral, political, social, Restoration, but it's underpinned by a philosophical, cultural, uh, human, and species transformation, uh, a transformation of ourselves. You know, yes, yes, through that that recognition that we are nature and nature is us. Yes, the inseparability of of that, uh, but also like sort of go with they go beyond. Uh, certain kinds of dichotomies, which uh, and the dualisms of global, local, social. Um, political self, other, subject, object, but we have to have a revolutionary transformation of self, um, you know, which to transcend, our, transcend what we've been taught about individualism, petty egotism, materialism, consumerism, and all of these things. Um, and to learn to, get, again, to think collectively and act collectively rather than individually. You know, this is the key. Arturo Escobar says this. Think collectively, act collectively. This is how you move forward. And I, I, was, I was reminded of uh, this book by Richard Tarnas, which was called The Passion of the Western Mind. And in the epilogue to that book, it's quite an old book now, he, he talks about the roots of the present crisis, which is, might say, the present crisis of capitalist modernity. And he says there are two key elements of the pathology that have to be overcome, the legacies of the Western mind over the dominance of the world. And, and one is the excessive dominance of masculine attributes of the psyche, which is a profound imbalance. Yeah? And that ring, you're kind of echoing uh, Jung, Carl Jung, that this, 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 there, there's a profound rebalancing, refeminization, demasculinization that's needed in the human psyche to, to heal our culture, you know, deep pathology in our culture. And the other is the excessive human species dominance over all the other planetary domain of life. It's objectification. Mere objects, and the mere objects can, you be, can be treated without moral reference, right? Uh, well, this is a fundamental problem which is also related to hypermasculinity in the psyche. The two can't be, be separated out. So this is part of the profound transformation we have to make inside ourselves and then collectively. 
and across the whole civilization to, to, to heal its malaise and the sources of the crisis. So I, I think I'm going to save time. I'm going to skip over. I had a section on global extractivism and the, and the necessity for a post-extractivist world order. I mean, extractivism is is deeply embedded in the in the world system for five millennia. But in the, in the past uh, few centuries of colonialism, imperialism, it has intensified and become a global system, deeply embedded in the last several decades, and now massively in intensified. Rather than retreating, it's intensifying. And part of the intensification has to do with the so-called green capitalism, uh, you know, green extractivism, uh, green neocolonialism, as we've heard already, which, which I agree with. It is. Uh, so I just wanted to point out to people uh, uh, that I've, I've got the last few years in University of Helsinki, where I am, we've started this uh, Global Extractivisms and Alternatives Initiative. And there's a lot of work there that we've been doing about this to try to theorize extractivism and define global extractivism, do a lot of case studies, and also work on alternatives which create post-extractivist transformations in the world. It's a kind of necessary part of what has to happen. We have to move to a post-extractivist way of living. You know, which is which is a really big concept. But you know, I just ask you to maybe have a look at that. Uh, the University of Helsinki, extractivisms and alternatives initiative. But one of the things I wanted to say that that post-extractivism requires I mean, at the center of some of the things we need to understand conceptually to do is is is, re, is decommodification of every sphere of life, the recommoning of every sphere of life. Uh, the radical democratization of every sphere of life. These are socialism. These are anti-capitalist. But we, 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 we don't always talk about them with such a centrality, you know, of the processes that need to be enacted, that need to be achieved, you know, that we, we fight for. Uh, it's well, I mean, people here know this. But one of the things I've just been working on, I'm working on a book with my friend, Hamid Hosseini, uh, on a new theory of value, what we call a communist theory of value, which is out, uh, this is a, a theory of value where we uh, talk about the, the value that capital creates is a kind of fetish value. But it's in most economics, it's the only kind of value that's considered. And all the other types of human value that are based, uh, that are sub, you know, kind of sub submerged, latent, perennial, ever-present, ever-potent, which dominate much of, the, much of our life. You know, elements of human life like love, care, empathy, uh, mutual aid, Solidarity, all the things that make us human uh, that James was talking about last night. You know, these are outside the value system, the normal value system in economics. So we want to elevate the, and define the notion of true value outside capitalist social relations, outside the domination and sub subordination of capital, and re-elevate re that whole concept as, again, what we're struggling for. We're struggling to create the conditions where true value can now prevail in human society again as opposed to capitalist value, which is a form of subordination and unfreedom. So I just want to end by, by saying that, uh, you know, the, the dialectical and, his, and holistic understanding of world system history, uh, and I think which Ogilvy says many, many times, shows us very clearly that there's a perennial will to resist. There's a perennial historical and popular will to try to achieve a life that is outside the domination of capital, of the state, and of the, of the empire, yes? And this is what, you know, it is, it is necessary to have a, a historically informed critique of capitalist modernity, the forms that, that, that it are, characterize it, how we got here, where we seem to be going. But it, the critique is not enough. You, have to, you must have transformative praxis. You must act, you know, which we, we've been hearing and hearing and hearing, which is, which is true. And you must clearly understand the forms, the visions, the practices, the processes that you need to achieve. Otherwise, you will probably fail or be crushed. Yeah? Not just to recapitulate what was done in the past, which failed. All that we've been hearing, the time we've been here. This, re this lesson is repeated powerfully and clearly throughout all of Ogilvy's writing. You know, which is, again, why I've made myself a student of Ogilvy. So I'm just saying, like, well, maybe just, uh, just for what it's worth, I mean, I, I would like to declare that... Uh, uh, I, I will now, and I hope you will be, a conscientious objector to neoliberalism and neoliberal economic globalization, a conscientious objector to capitalist modernity, a conscientious objector to global extractivism, and a conscientious objector to the empire of capital. As James said, we use what we have and do what we can. We move forward together, and we relearn how to live collectively and build a free life. 
and reclaim our world from the empire of capital. Thanks. Thank you, Barry.